Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, I rise first and foremost on behalf of the government of Barbados and the members of the parliamentary majority to salute and congratulate Dame Sandra Prunella Mason, who has just been elected by a two-thirds majority in each of the two houses of parliament to be the president-elect of Barbados. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the election of a president of this nation is a seminal moment in the journey of our continued growth as a nation, recognizing that those who have occupied this land whether those who came before, whose names are never referred to, literally the indigenous Indians, or whether those who came in the modern settlement at 1625 and claimed as theirs that which was not theirs, or whether those who were forced to come here as slaves or as indentured servants or indeed as migrants or whether those who have come here in recent times as their own free will. We have had a journey that has been in our view one that has fought against all oppression and exploitation to reach to the point where sir we are in a position to claim our own destiny. That those who fought in the 1930s, in particular those who rose up in 1937, to say that theirs was a life that could no longer be tolerated, or those who came thereafter with the establishment of the political parties and the establishment of the Barbados Workers' Union, or those who came with the establishment of the Bush experiment to change how we govern ourselves in the executive function, or under the right excellence of Grant Lee Herbert Adams, who in 1950 led the Universal Adult Suffrage Bill through this parliament to give all of us the right to vote, recognizing that simply the delivery of the franchise to women in 1945 would not be sufficient because women were still required to be part of a propertied class in order to vote. Or those who came in 1966, whether first mounting the discussion for the independence of this nation with the Barbados Independence Conference in the United Kingdom and ultimately the acclamation of independence under the right excellent Errol Walton Barrow to be regarded as the father of independence not just then but forevermore. Or those who came in the form of the Honorable John Michael Jeffrey Manningham Adams and singled out that relationship with property is the most fundamental relationship of any human being in a democracy. Or those like the late Owen Seymour Arthur, who understood that the completion of independence could not be had without the reclaiming of our destiny with respect to the head of our judiciary and the abolition of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council to be the final court of appeal of this country could not reflect well in an independent country the pride which we have in being able to control our own destiny. Or like the Right Honorable Sir Lloyd Erskine Sandiford who in his own inimitable style was prepared to put country above self in what he did ultimately to right size and stabilize this economy irrespective of who was responsible for it being there. 
Mr. Speaker, this is a seminal moment for this nation. But it is not one that we come to lightly. We have reached this moment on the eve of our 55th year of independence. And we all know in our own lives that to reach 55, if you are not comfortable with yourself, if you are not confident in yourself, then something is fundamentally wrong. And this government, like those who went before, and who express confidence in the journey, even if not completing the process, we believe that the time has come for us to claim our full destiny and to recognize in reality what has been the position. And what do I mean, sir? There can be no issue of the time in being bad at 55 years old. And the question as to why now I would want to be able to give full expression to today. Because this is really not about November 30th, 2021. This is about December 1st, 2021. This is about being able to use this as the springboard that we as a nation need in order to confront a completely different reality. In many instances, even significantly different from that which confronted us as a nation when we became the government of this nation just over three years ago. Our reality is that the world has confronted a pandemic, the likes of which have not been seen for over a century. The reality is that for the first time since being an independent nation, this country has had to contend with double-digit declines, not due to anything done by anyone here, but due to the reality of a COVID pandemic that has decimated every single tourism and travel-dependent nation of the entire global community of nations. Every one without exception. And it is the judgment of this government that this country must rise together and must have the confidence to fight together to be able to build forward better because the combination of the pandemic with what is now commonly regarded as the existential crisis, that of the climate crisis, stands in conjunction with the reality of the report of our National Population Commission that our labor force shall be smaller in 13 years than it is now to create a confluence of events that if left untouched will do much to undermine the stability of our nation and ultimately the stability and prosperity of our people. And Mr. Speaker, there are many who have asked, why now? And we say, if ever there was a time that this nation needs to bind itself together. If ever there was a time we must move from a con covenant of hope to the confidence necessary, it is now. And Mr. Speaker, we are very, very, very clear that the confidence that is needed to be able to meet the moment that we face comes first and foremost in understanding, sir, that when we look in the mirror, as the right excellent Errol Walton Barrow would have said, we must love what we see. And there can be no better way to reflect the love of self than to accept that one of your very own 
born of this nation, shaped by this nation, adding to this nation, bringing honor to this nation, that that person should be elected here today. Like the leader of the opposition, I take pride in the fact that it is a woman of the soil to whom this honor is being given and conferred by the members of both houses of parliament. Like the leader of the opposition, I know only too well the journey that it has taken for women to come to any position that they did not hold before and the extent to which it has been the subject of all kinds of difficulties and regrettably in some instances misogyny. I know only too well that those of us for whom that honor is given come not to be the first ever but come to ensure that we will never be the last. And Mr. Speaker, I believe that that is the position of the person whom we have now elected as our first woman president, but also our first president of this nation, Barbados. And, and sir, at 55 years old, we are very clear as a government that if we could not be caught loitering on colonial premises in 1966, there is no way that in the third decade of the 21st century, we should have the decisions of this parliament or the executive of this nation be ultimately signed off on by those who are not born of here, who do not live here, and who do not appreciate the daily realities of those who live here. And Mr. Speaker, that is not meant to be a statement of condemnation of anyone. In fact, we look forward to continuing the relationship with the British monarch, but we are conscious that after 396 years of British rule, and probably just over 386 years of British monarchical rule, taking into account the break that took place in the 17th century because of Oliver Cromwell, that the time has come for us to express the full confidence in ourselves as a people and to believe that it is possible for one born of this nation to sign off finally and completely. And Mr. Speaker, you know, COVID has a way of laying bare all that we face. And in the last 20 months, if you ever doubted that Barbados was alone in this world, you saw the full example of it with respect to COVID. Those who were overseas territories or departments were given the opportunity to access what they needed to access. And those of us who were independent, but still constrained by constitutional monarchy or head of state, were still left out there without recourse to anyone. In those circumstances, how can anyone deny the rightness of the moment? Recognizing that more importantly than all of that, that we need a mobilizing force and a unifying force to allow us to fight battles that hitherto in an independent Barbados we have not had to fight. And forgive me, sir, if I dwell for two or three minutes on it, because sometimes I feel that the absence of real engagement on these fundamental issues in this nation may mean that we are not properly preparing ourselves for what is ahead of us, what is ahead of us. And Mr. Speaker, sometimes people may feel that we are being esoteric, but you cannot explain to the people of this nation what lies ahead of them 
by being disingenuous and ignoring the reality of their condition. Sir, people want to know why now in the middle of a pandemic? And Mr. Speaker, I say more than ever, it must be now because we need everyone to get out of this pandemic. The reconstruction and the recovery from COVID will not be easy. And it requires the majority of us to act together. And whether it is going to be in the rebuilding of the tourism sector, we must go for the best. And we must reflect the best. Or whether it is in the acknowledgement that the new oil is food and water, and that what we must strive for is not simply food security, but food and nutritional security, so that you do not end up being the very same problem that the Honorable Minister of Health has been trying to fight against because of the extent to which how you eat may lead to massive comorbidities. Or whether it is that we must understand that in a digital world, we have the platform truly to be global citizens with Barbadian roots because the tools allow us to engage and the geography of our nation does not limit where we can engage or whether it is in instilling in our people the need to care for each other beyond recognizing the word C-A-R-E but doing it in tangible ways, recognizing that the share pot mentality didn't only serve to bring slaves and ex-slaves out of the bowels of poverty, but that the same attitude and values that led to that share pot are the same attitude and values that will help us rise from this moment in time. Or whether it is, Mr. Speaker, that we accept that we must earn our way in this world and that nobody is going to give us a handout. But if all that we had to face was COVID, we would hold our heads, we would reflect, and we would say, wow. We might even say, woe is me. But when you add to that, sir, the existential crisis of climate. And we don't have to ask anybody about that boat here now. Those who can't get water regularly in the last few years in this country, and who now know that Barbados is not only one of the 15 most water scarce countries, but that there is a further affecting, further reduction in our groundwater, and that there is danger of some aquifers becoming incapable of being used because of salt water intrusion or the coastal defenses that have gone and that have seen people lose their backyard whether in the west coast of this nation or in St. John and Glen Burnie and others where the land has simply fallen in to the sea or whether it is the underwater springs that continue to dislocate the stability of the roads and the lands in the Scotland district or whether it is the check dams that have now to be built so water does not run from St. Andrew to Jackson to Green Hill to Bridgetown to wash away people. Just as Karoo was washed away in Lower Carlton with a similar occurrence, by the way, only two months ago, coming through the exact channels in Lower Carlton. Mr. Speaker, climate crisis is real. And regrettably, the world is showing that it is not prepared to meet the 1.5 degrees and therefore this country will have about 12 years at best to properly adapt and to do the things necessary to protect our population. And Mr. Speaker, when we add to that the reduced labor force, Mr. Speaker, 
that is why now this country for the next 12 to 15 years will be asked to perform a duty that is Herculean in task, but it's not impossible in achievement. And it requires a maturity, a discipline, an empathy, a Barbadian common sense to anchor us and to keep us focused on that journey. It will come in requiring leadership at all levels, not just from the president whom we elect here today, not just from the members of parliament who are constituted here today, but across every firm, across every institution, across every church, across every household, across every community, across every club, across every team. And that is why, sir, you may sometimes see me reflect and be a little sad. Because I came into public life in a country where there was a commitment to keep certain things above partisan divide. And if I have but one wish between now and when I leave this nation and this earth, it is that this country will respect that. 166 square miles cannot fight the world divided. 166 square miles cannot save itself divided. And I can only share, sir, my experience on this journey. Conscious that the Lord has blessed me with the opportunity to have been exposed to each of this country's prime ministers before. Not premier, but prime ministers. And that in so engaging with them, I trust and pray that I have accepted the honor of defending the dignity of this nation and that I've asked this government, which I have the honor to lead, to similarly do so. And this parliament of which I am a member to equally do so. Mr. Speaker, it is critical that we know what battles to fight where and when. It is critical. And it is the signals that we send to all others in recognizing that. I know what it is to have been sent by the then Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Owen Seymour Arthur, to do a number of things. When Sir George Allen was being elected, to the Pan-American Health Organization and for that election, like any election, you have to canvass. The father of one of our members, Senator Tate, was at the forefront of that election along with the Honorable Elizabeth Thompson, who was then Minister of Health. When this country made the determination that we would have to issue arbitral proceedings against Trinidad and Tobago, our sister nation in Caribbean community. It was not done without the deepest consultation and agreement. And when we determined that we would go to the Caribbean Court of Justice, it was my lot to have chaired the preparatory committee for the establishment of that court from August 2001 to when it was inaugurated in 2005. And it was therefore my lot to deal with the opposition because what equally like this moment was required was a constitutional amendment. And I thank God that unlike other nations in the region, 
that have hitherto been able to reach national consensus on this fundamental and vital matter that Barbados was able to reach consensus with the then leader of the opposition, David Thompson, and myself meeting and signing off that this could not be a matter that divided the children of independence of this nation. Mr. Speaker, I say these things because it is also important for me to explain why now about some of the values that we keep. I had calls last week in Washington, D.C. to deliver myself of the remarks made by the right excellent Errol Walton Barrow on two occasions to indicate that this is who we are as a people. When President Lyndon Johnson asked him if he was prepared to allow the United States of America to pay for Barbados to become a member of the Organization of American States, the then Prime Minister said to him that where we come from, if you can't afford to pay the Jews, you do not join the club. And that when combined with the now famous statement of foreign policy that still has informed every government since that day because it captured the essence of who we were as a people, that we should be friends of all and satellites of none, you begin to understand the people who you are dealing with in this nation and why therefore there can be no other right person to be president of this nation than a person born of this nation. So Mr. Speaker, we are here, yes, to complete the task of independence, but more importantly, to position the springboard that is necessary for us to undertake the most difficult mission that this independent nation has had to confront. Not because of things we have done on our own, Necessarily, not at all. The climate crisis, we all know. We are not the ones who have emitted the greenhouse gases, but we are the ones on the front line who are paying the dearest prices. The pandemic didn't start about here, but there is no part of the world that has not been touched by this pandemic. And the one thing we perhaps had control over, how do we replace our population and how do we deal with an aging population? We are now finding that we are late to the game. And if we do not act with dispatch, the consequences will be real. Mr. Speaker, I'm not going into the other ones that concern us and of which we are fully seized of the difficulties. Chronic NCDs, the violence and abuse in our society. The Honorable Member spoke about the plight of single women. We've been talking about it and doing things about it. That's why the minimum wage was so critical because more than any other class of person, it is single women who are affected by the absence of a minimum wage. And therefore, this government must walk the walk and not talk the talk. If we look at those people who are under earning under $25,000 for the first time in this country's history, people earning between $1,500 and $2,000 a month, that's over $2,000 a month, get back a reverse tax credit of $1,300 a year, never done before. The majority of those people are in fact single women. This government brought female unemployment down to 8 point, to, 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 um, Unemployment was down to 8.9%, but for the first time in recent memory for us, for sure, female unemployment was less than male unemployment before the pandemic started. And from the time the pandemic came, female unemployment shot up once again over male unemployment because of the fact that the majority of women work in services in this country and it is the services sector that has been debilitated. So I'm glad that we 
share the same perspective on what must be done. And to recognize that having a single woman as governor general or a single woman as prime minister or six or seven or eight or nine or ten in here cannot suffice to correct centuries of misogyny and centuries of discrimination. And I thank the Honorable Leader of the Opposition for joining me in this battle now to make sure that well is done by our women and right is done by our women. Mr. Speaker, we look forward, therefore, to the 1st of December, 2021. But we do so confident that we have just elected from among us a woman who is uniquely and passionately Barbadian, does not pretend to be anything else, reflects the values of who we are, has been able, in spite of her achievement of many firsts, to maintain a humility that is so admired by our people. Barbadians do not like boastful people. That is not our nature. But we like confident people, and we like proud people, and we like industrious people. And we like people who fight for the underdog, who believe in social justice, who believe in fairness. That is who we are. And I can think, therefore, of no better person at this juncture of our nation who can reflect that, those values, and who also, by dint of their life, I've shown you that it is not simply about the fighting for rights, which is absolutely essential in a post-colonial society, but that they also recognize the responsibilities that must go hand in hand with the gift of those rights. And those responsibilities come with an understanding that there is no one else to look over us there is no one else to clean and maintain the house of state but us, who we see in the mirror, is who will be responsible for maintaining the ship of state. And like every other institution, if there is no maintenance, it will fall apart. Things shall fall apart, in the words of Chinua Achebe. Mr. Speaker, this is our moment. In May 2016, this parliamentary majority party gathered at Solidarity House to pass and launch the Covenant of Hope. The first chapter in the Covenant of Hope, which was a covenant that spoke to who we are, what we stand for, and what we shall fight for as a movement of people. The first chapter was on confidence and building self-esteem. Mr. Speaker, we have moved from the covenant of hope to the ultimate act of confidence. I trust and pray that those who come after us will understand that we made a determination that there shall be a two-thirds majority of each house because this country must always find its way to find someone who can unite all opinions in this country. We are simply too small not to make the most extraordinary efforts to find that person who can provide that unity of purpose for this nation. Unlike other countries, and unlike the requests of many, when asked 
whether we would agree to a step down provision to a simple majority in the absence of agreement on the first two ballots, we have said no. Because we believe that we must always dig deep to find that higher place. Similarly, I am conscious that I've taken the decision as Prime Minister of this nation to abandon powers that every other previous Prime Minister has had. I do so as a child of independence and as a child who would have been expected to walk this journey by the right excellent Sir Grant Lee Adams who gave us that right to vote and by the right excellent Earl Walton Barrow who gave us that step into independence. And what are those powers that have been reduced? Mr. Speaker, prior to today, this country had eight governors general. Sir John Montagu Sto was appointed by a prime minister in consultation with the leader of the opposition. Sir Arlie Winston Scott was similarly appointed. Sir Dighton Lyle Ward was similarly appointed. Sir Hugh Springer was similarly appointed. Dame Nita Barrow was similarly appointed. Sir Clifford Husbands was similarly appointed. Sir Elliot Belgriff was similarly appointed. And the person who has the honor to be our first president-elect was similarly appointed by the previous prime minister consulting with me as leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, here and after, we have shown today that that power of the appointment to a head of state shall not be the gift of a prime minister. Absolutely, with just this requirement to consult the leader of the opposition. But it now carries itself to the reflection of confidence in our highest offices of representational politics, the Parliament of this nation, the joint houses of the Parliament of this nation. And if we are to recall what sovereignty truly is, sovereignty is the power in a state to do everything necessary to govern itself. And in a republic, the state in which sovereignty resides is in the people and in the representative offices of the people. That we can now have this high power reside in the parliament of this nation rather than in the office of a single person, even though they be prime minister is a significant advancement in the democracy of this nation. And Mr. Speaker, it doesn't come on its own because we have taken similar decisions for the Judicial Advisory Appointments Committee as established by law by this parliament to ensure that even in the appointment of Chief Justice and judges of the High Court and the Court of Appeal now, those decisions will no longer be taken by a prime minister of this nation acting once again in conjunction, in consultation rather, with the leader of the opposition, but are now taken on the basis of recommendations made by a judicial advisory appointments committee to the prime minister. Mr. Speaker, I pause on these two occasions because it is important that we understand that the journey of development is a relay race. And none of us will be expected to complete it, but neither are we at liberty to resile from it, as is reflected in the Talmud. This country has come to be regarded as one that punches above its weight. It is our responsibility to ensure that that reputation 
and that acclaim as reflected by other nations of the world be continued to be associated with us. But above all else, I pray that we go forward as a people who understand that our biggest challenges and our biggest opponents today come not from within, but from the battles that we must fight across the world and globally. And if we remember that, sir, then we remember that whether it is from the president of the Barbados or whether it is from those who are the youngest in this land, that there must be a unity of purpose to carry us forward. And I pray that this simple but profound act today will give us the strength and courage to know that we can meet all manner of man or woman as equal persons. It has often been said that a man or a woman, even if they have one pants, one bag, one dress, they are still a man or a woman. And that the dignity that must attach to that must never be forgotten. If I extrapolate that and say whether it is 300,000 people or 300 million people as we found out is the population in the United States of America or Indonesia or 300,000 here it matters not for the right to be able to chart the destiny of a people and to stand up and to defend them against all the odds is a sacred right which we claim on behalf of our people and which we express now with absolute confidence that irrespective of the challenges, cognizant of the opportunities, conscious of the need for unity, that Barbados shall move forward on the 1st of December as the newest republic in the global community of nations, conscious that we are going, not without concern on the part of some, but with absolute determination that at 55 we must know who we are, we must live who we are, and we must be who we are. Mr. Speaker, I'm obliged to you.